Well, good day to you, uh, or good morning, good evening. Um, we'll be doing the lesson for May 31st, 2020. But folks, this is going to be our last lesson in, the, in Romans. We'll be in this, uh, in the, in this book, uh, in, our, in our lesson book, uh, Explore the Bible. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, it'll be the last lesson <clears throat> in Romans today. And, uh, and we'll be moving into another book, I'm sure. Um, you know, usually I like to start out with a little something that's just to, just to start it out. But, you know, I will tell you a story. There was a story about these six rangers who were trailing a bad gang. And as they were doing it, uh, they were ambushed. All but one was killed. I think most of you know the story. But there was a fellow by the name of Tonto who came and found one of them still alive. And he buried him and he uh, helped this fellow get back, to, uh, and back together again or back uh, healthy. You know this man to be the Lone Ranger. So, you know, uh, the reason why I thought about that is because uh, that's how this writer in this book started about with that particular one. The name was John Reed. He was the masked man known as the Lone Ranger. But anyway, I hope you're smiling today, and I hope you're having a good week, and I uh, hope you're staying healthy, and I, uh, I'll be glad when we get back together. This is awkward in here by yourself. But you know, usually what I do is I go around our room, around my room. I'm actually in Bill's room, as you mostly all know. Um, but I still see my people around the table, and I say my people are in fellowship. And you know, on this end right here, I'm going to start with them. I'm going to say Carolyn, Kelly, and Billy Weldon. I'm going to say Bobby Frandis. At the end of the table, I'm going to say uh, Larry and, and Sandy Terry. Then I'm going to say Deanna and Keith Bornman, Marcia Crosby, Celia Bell, and my wife Stephanie Wells. But you know, I usually go around the room, and but the first thing I want to do today is I want to open in prayer. I um, we usually have a prayer list, and we don't have a copy of it here, but there are many that are hurting in our church, and and uh, they need our prayers and. So I want to lift them this morning to you, or lift them to the Lord, I mean. And also we have uh, the Joneses. Darnie Jones passed away, as you know. And, and I just want to lift the Jones family in particular. And I just understood that Pat and Ken Persine have lost their daughter with an accident the day before yesterday, Thursday. And let's lift them in prayer uh, to the Lord that, uh, that he'll just help them through this time of Terrible, terrible time. Uh, so with that said, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this day, this beautiful day that you've given us, to give you thanks for the day. And to, most importantly, thank you for Jesus Christ who died on the cross so that we could be saved. And Lord, we just lift these people to you that are on our prayer list. We lift these in our church. We lift our friends and relatives that are hurting. Lord, we lift uh, the, the Persines and the Joneses to you, Lord, and ask that you just give them the peace that only comes from you. And Father, we ask that you bless this Sunday school lesson today and that you'll help me to lead it correctly. And, and Lord, I just thank you that you just, just guide us and lead us by the Holy Spirit. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray to you. Amen and amen. Folks, I'm going to say continue to pray for our nation as you well know. <laughs> There's a, this stuff going on is, is taking its toll on people. So let's continue to pray to the Lord for our nation, just as we've done many times, and continue to do that. So, uh, you know, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the lesson. If you want to read with me in our book, we'll, uh, if you have one, please do so. The lesson's called Reach today. You know what it says? Believers must make every effort to share the gospel with everyone. Yes, folks, that is our responsibility, is to share the gospel, you know. Uh, I want to say that God judges the heart. And your sins may be secret to man, but nothing is hidden from God. Jesus Christ is the judge of all of us. We will stand or fall by Him. If He is our Savior and Lord, we will go to, the he to, go to heaven. And if we, 
have not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior or Lord, we are lost. You know, uh, I will tell you a little, I always had a little bit to add, and I'll add this to it today as well. Uh, you know, on May 24, 1738, a discouraged missionary went very unwillingly to a religious meeting in London. There a miracle took place. About a quarter before nine, he wrote in his journal, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, yes, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You know, that missionary was John Wesley. I'm sure you've heard of him. The message he heard that evening was the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on the book we're studying today, Romans. You know, just a few months before that, though John Wesley had written in his journey, I went to America to convert the Indians. But, oh, who shall convert me? You know, that evening in Aldersgate Street, his question was answered. And the result was the great Wesleyan revival that swept England and transformed the nation. You know, Paul's epistle to the Romans is still transforming people's lives today. Just the way it transformed Martin Luther and John Wesley. The one scripture above others that brought Luther out of mere religion into the joy of salvation by grace through faith was Romans 1.17. The just, just shall live by faith. Faith, folks, alone. You know the Protestant Reformation and the Wesleyan Revival were both the fruit of this wonderful letter written by Paul from Corinth about the year 56 A.D. The letter was carried to the Christians at Rome by one of the deaconesses of the church, and her name was Sister Phoebe, as I'm sure you've heard. It talks about her in chapter 16, which is after this lesson. But imagine this. You and I can read and study the same inspired letter that brought life and power to Luther and Wesley. And the same Holy Spirit who taught them can teach us. You know, you and I can experience revival in our hearts, our homes, and churches. If the message of this letter grips us, it has, as it has gripped men of faith in centuries past. So moving into our lesson more this morning, we're going to be studying in Romans in your book, if you will. Romans 15, chapter 15, verses 14 through 21, and verses 30 through 33. And here's where I started. John Reed, the name of the masked man known as the Lone Ranger, was rarely alone. He was lone in that he was the sole survivor of an ambush by outlaws, but he was far from alone because he had a companion. You know, sometimes we might think of Paul as a Lone Ranger, but his mission required him also to depend on others. You know, the sharing of the gospel requires a team effort. And Paul reminded the Roman believers of this in the closing letter, of the closing section of this letter. All right, moving into the, understand the context this morning. As Paul closed his letter to the Romans, he returned to the topic of salvation. But in a different context, while he had used the first part of the epistle to show that everyone needs a Savior, he now emphasized the responsibility Christians have to share that Savior with others. Paul had a passionate desire to extend the reach of the gospel beyond Rome to areas outside the empire. Instead of building on someone else's foundation, he wanted to reach those who had never heard the name, the name of Jesus. Of course, the Great Commission, you remember that, included familiar places like Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but it also pointed believers to wider regions, the uttermost parts of the world. The residents of those churches were heaviest on Paul's heart as he wrote this letter to the church. The apostle knew that he could not succeed on his own, so he asked the believers in Rome for help. This help might have included financial offerings, I'm sure it did, but Paul primarily requested their prayers on his behalf. He had, others, he, he had other issues to resolve before he could realize his dream, and he asked that they pray for him in those matters. Paul closed his letter with a long list of fellow believers who had been faithful partners with him through the years. While the apostle had not yet visited Rome, 
He apparently had met some members of the Roman church doing his travels. He wanted them to know how much he appreciated them before he added one final warning and one final blessing, as he does in chapter 16. All right, I'm going to move and explore the context this morning and get into our verses. Uh, if you want to, go along with me. Fulfill your calling is the first part of this lesson today. And Paul states, My brothers and sisters, I myself am convinced about you that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of the gospel of God. My purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We'll get into that a little more in a minute. Paul called the Romans brothers and sisters. We call each other brothers and sisters. Even though he had met, never met many of them, he considered them family, both in his affection for them and in his partnership with them. Paul shared some kind words for the Romans, not as flattery, but because he was convinced they were spiritually healthy. Morally, they demonstrated goodness. They understood the difference between right and wrong, and they did this best to choose what was right. You know, intellectually, they were filled with all, with all knowledge. They had been taught well and had held firm to those teachings. You know, their doctrinal integrity meant they could instruct one another. They could encourage each other, but they also could hold each other accountable when necessary, and that's what we should do. All in all, the Romans were solid Christ followers, as it reads this morning. So I'll break it down just a second here. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Unless we understand that, that, that ministry of Paul, the distinctive ministry of Paul, I probably would say, we will not fully appreciate the message of God's grace. And Paul explained the characteristics of his ministry. First of all, it was received by grace. When he was Saul of Tarsus, you remember, the crusading rabbi, Paul knew little of the grace of God. He persecuted the church and he sought to destroy it. But when Paul met Jesus Christ on that Damascus road, he experienced the grace of God. It was God's grace that saved him, and it was God's grace that called him and made him an apostle. Yes, it is God's grace that saves you. Okay, moving on a little bit in our book. Verses 15 and 16, it says, Never, he says, Nevertheless, or the writer says, Nevertheless, Paul also knew that the Romans still had things to learn. No one had it all together spiritually. But all of them had the potential to become more like Christ. Folks, no, we don't have it all together spiritually, but we do need to become more like Christ, and we need to strive to do that daily. You know, He wrote them to fill, to fill in some gaps and to remind them of things they needed to remember. I've said that many times in our class. I don't, I don't think we can hear it enough sometimes, folks. Yes, you know, we need to be reminded of things. Paul confessed that he wrote more boldly to a church he did not plant than one might expect, but his authority was as an apostle made it possible. In addition, the grace of God, the unmerited gift he had received through Christ, pushed him to be as clear as possible about these important matters. Whether he was sharing a doctrine that was new to them or simply restating an important truth they had forgotten, it was all part of drawing them closer to Jesus Christ. And it was all part of his goal of helping them to become more like Jesus. God had called Paul to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, while Peter and others working among the Jews. Paul had a heart and passion for non-Jewish people, folks. You know, many Roman Christians were Gentiles, and Paul felt a special urgency toward them. He also saw himself as a priest of the gospel. In the Old Testament, priests spoke on God's behalf. They shared his words with his people. Paul saw his responsibility in a similar way. He proclaimed God's truth to others. You know, but priests also presented offerings, and Paul embraced that metaphor. He wanted to present as many Gentile believers as possible to God as an acceptable offering. Okay, now I'll break that down just a second. He says, all right, it was centered on the gospel. 
Okay. Paul used two different words for minister in this verse, but the emphasis is on priestly service. You know, Paul looked on himself as a priest at the altar, offering up to God the Gentiles he had won to Christ. You know, a spiritual sacrifice to the glory of God. Even his preaching of the gospel was a priestly duty. You know, it adds dignity and responsibility to even to our service, folks. It was important that the priest offer to God only that which was the best. You know, note the involvement of the Trinity in the ministry of the Word. Paul was the minister of Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel of God and he served in the power of the Holy Spirit of God who sanctified his ministry. What a privilege, folks. What a privilege. And yet what a responsibility to be the servant of the triune God. Winning the loss to Jesus Christ. What a responsibility we have. What a privilege we have that we know Jesus Christ and that we can share him with others. You know, we must remember that soul winning is a priestly ministry, a sacred obligation, and we must serve the Lord with dedication and devotion just as the priest of the temple did, just as Paul. Moving into the second part of our lesson today is boast about Jesus and the verses Paul's written here. And it says, Therefore I have reason to boast in Christ Jesus regarding what pertains to God. For I would not dare say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me by word and deed for the obedience of the Gentiles, by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, and by the power of God's Spirit. As a result, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, you know, so Paul had suffered much, preached a great deal, and established churches all over the map. But he never bragged about his accomplishments. You know, he was too busy bragging about Jesus Christ, and that's what we should be doing. Paul had reason to boast in Christ. The fact is, he knew he had no power of his own. You know, folks, anything that had been done for God in his kingdom was accomplished through Jesus Christ. You know, Paul wanted the Romans to know that if they chose to support him, they would be supporting Christ's work. But Paul was doing God's work, not promoting his own agenda. You know, after 2,000 years, we recognize the great impact of Paul's life. The Romans perhaps understood it as well, even in the first century. But Paul demonstrated an incredibly, incredible humility and keen understanding of what the Christian life is all about. He knew it would be foolish to dare say anything about his own achievements. Yes, Paul realized that Christ alone accomplished this work through him. I pray that we all understand that. Paul could say, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. This didn't mean that everyone had heard about Jesus, but that he had completely fulfilled his calling to that point. You know, Jerusalem represents the birthplace of Christianity. While Illyricum was the Roman process between Greece and Italy, Christ's ministry through Paul had reached from the heart of Judaism to the proverbial outskirts of Rome. So, what are we saying? It was done for God's glory. He says, therefore I glory, I glory in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and my service to God. You know the word translated glory carries the idea of boast and, and maybe take pride in. And Paul used it before in Romans many times. Paul was not bragging about his ministry, folks. He was boasting in what the Lord had done. Yes, the apostle did not serve and suffer as he did just to make a name for himself. For he had a much higher purpose in mind. He wanted to bring glory to Jesus Christ. You know, so, it was done by God's power. The Holy Spirit empowered Paul to minister. The miracles God gave Paul to do were signs and that they, they came from God and revealed him to others. And they were wonders and that they aroused the wonder of the people. But their purpose was always to open the way for the preaching of the gospel. And the miracles were given to, the, given to authenticate the message and the messenger. You know, miracles by themselves can never save a lost person. 
you know. You know, when Paul healed a crippled man at Lystra, if you remember that in Acts, the immediate response from the people was pagan. You know, the people called Paul and Barnabas gods and tried to worship them. And when Paul shared the gospel with them, they did not respond so enthusiastically. Finally, the people stoned Paul and left him for dead outside the city walls. You know, the Spirit of God empowered Paul to share the word, and the purpose was to make the Gentiles obedient. It was by word and deed that the apostles shared the good news. You know, we may not be able to perform miracles today, folks, but since this was a, well, it was a very special gift, but by word and, by word and, 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 and deed, we can share the love of God with the lost around us. And again, that is our responsibility. Moving to the third section, seek the lost. Reading Paul's words here, verses 20, 21. My aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named, so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. You know, in Acts 1.8, Jesus outlined the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Paul recognized that God was using him to fulfill that mission. His aim was to evangelize areas where Christ had not been preached. This, mo this motivated Paul and gave him a sense of urgency. Paul's strategy was to preach the gospel where Jesus was unknown rather than to preach where the, someone else's foundation had been laid. Paul typically would visit one of the empire's population centers and establish a church. Then once those believers were healthy enough to continue the mission on their own, he would move on to another city. He knew that, just like today, the world still had plenty of unreached people who need to hear about the Savior. You know, as he often did, Paul quoted the Old Testament to underscore the logic and importance of his plan. Turning to Isaiah, he noted that individuals who didn't know God will see, and those who had never heard it will understand. Many would respond to the gospel if given the opportunity, and Paul wanted to be God's instrument for giving them that opportunity. Paul had spent his ministry breaking new ground for the gospel. In fact, one reason he had not yet visited Rome was that he was busy planting churches where none had existed before. So this was the next reasonable step for him. While we should never downplay the importance of uh, discipling believers, we also should never shy away from proclaiming him to those who have never heard of him. I'll add a little on to this. It was according to God's plan. God had a special plan for Paul to follow. He was not to preach where any other apostle had ministered. Now this is one evidence that Peter had not founded the churches at Rome, or had been to Rome, for matter of fact, for this would have prevented Paul from going there. You know, from Jerusalem around about to Illyricum, covers about 14,000 miles. That's a long ways. When you consider the slowness of travel and the dangers involved, you can appreciate the tremendous achievement of Paul's ministry and his, his missionary ministry. While it is not wrong to enter into another man's labors and to teach where another man is taught, it is also good to have a pioneering ministry and take the gospel to new territories. Paul cited Isaiah 52.15 as a define approval for this kind of ministry. The vast area of opportunity in other parts of the empire kept Paul from visiting Rome sooner. He was not hindered from going to Rome by satanic opposition or physical obstacles, but by the challenge of completing his work right where he was at. He was so faithful in his evangelistic outreach that he was able to say that he had no more places to minister in those parts. This did not mean that Paul personally witnessed every person in that area, folks, but that he took the gospel and left behind witnessing churches and Christians who would carry on the work. Paul finished one job before he started another, a good example for, for all our ministries today. And lastly, to say, 
last part of our lesson is called partnering partner with others now I appeal to you brothers and sisters through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in fervent prayers to God on my behalf pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the Saints and that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. May the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. You know, for the second time in this passage, Paul addressed his readers as brothers and sisters. It is impossible to escape the importance of relationships within the body of Christ. Paul understood that he did not minister in isolation. Because they shared this common bond, Paul appealed to the Roman believers for help. The word appeal indicates a strong request, but this request wasn't based on Paul's needs. It related to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who established their relationships and gave it meaning. It also related to the love of the Spirit, that is, the deep love that the Spirit gives believers for one another that should motivate them to pray for him. You know, instead of asking for financial support, Paul requested the Romans fervent prayers. His wording, strive together, paints the picture of an intense athletic struggle that requires great effort and coordinated teamwork. And yes, it's teamwork for us, folks. It's, it's a church. We are a team. Paul's experience told him that difficult times lay ahead and, and he would need partners willing to pray with him and for him. Paul specifically asked the Romans to pray about three challenges he knew he would be facing. First, he asked them to pray that he would be rescued from the believers in Judea. Many Jews in Jerusalem considered him a traitor to their faith, which would have put his life in danger. You know, secondly, he asked the Romans to pray that the financial gift he was bringing on behalf of the Gentile believers for hurting Christians in Judea would be acceptable to the saints. You know, his ministry to the Gentiles could raise concerns about, among a primary Jewish audience. So he asked that their hearts would be warm toward the mission God had given him. And finally, he asked them to pray that he would soon be able to visit them personally. You know, Paul had been delayed in the past by other obligations. But he sincerely wanted to connect with the Romans and be refreshed together with them. He longed for an opportunity to encourage them and be encouraged by them face to face. The book of Acts reveals that Paul's prayers were answered though maybe not as he expected. The Jewish Christians did welcome him. He was protected from his enemies by being arrested by the Romans, and he did make it to Rome as a prisoner to stand trial before Caesar. You know, after requesting a partnership of prayer from the believers in Rome, Paul offered a brief prayer on their behalf. He asked that they would experience the presence of the God of peace. The leaders of the Roman Empire took pride in what was known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But while the peace brought a degree of, of security to the empire, it was maintained through an iron fist of military might. It drew its power from fear and intimidation. The Roman Christians could draw from a deeper peace, a peace Paul told the Philippians goes beyond all understanding. I call it the depth of understanding. The depth of understanding. When you truly take it into your heart, and you truly understand the depth of it, that Paul did, and you've truly got it. You know, depth of understanding. So Paul's amen concluded his primary teaching in this letter. Chapter 16, after this, essentially includes a long list of Romans who, who had blessed him and others who wanted to bless the Romans. Again, he focused on the power of partnerships, which should encourage us to follow that example today. And yes, folks, we should follow Paul's example today. 2,000 years ago or more, he wrote this letter. And yes, we should, as one man said, you should read Romans every week. Well, I know we don't, but you should read it a lot. It refreshes you. You know, so... Finishing up this morning, he said, when the life of the Spirit flows through a church, giving is no problem. This church is a giving church, folks. Paul was anxious that this offering be received by the Jewish believers and be acceptable to them. He wanted to bring about under God a closer bond between the mother church of Jerusalem and the daughter churches in other parts of the empire. 
Unfortunately, there were still Jews who opposed the message of the grace to the Gentiles and who wanted the Gentiles to become Jews and accept the Jewish law. Folks, these people were called Judah Judaizers. They followed Paul wherever he went and tried to steal his churches away from him. The epistle to the, the Galatians was written to combat their evil works. The words strive together in Romans 15 verse 30 suggest an athlete giving his best in the contest. Perhaps the word wrestling together better expresses that idea. You know, this verse does not mean that we must fight with God to get what we need, folks. Rather, it means our praying must, be a ca must not be a casual experience that has no heart or earnestness. We should put as much fervor into our praying as a wrestler does in his wrestling, folks. Maybe the saying is you get what you, out of it what you put in it. So when finishing today, I'll have to tell you I've been nervous today. I'm, I'm sure it's shown, and that's okay. I don't mind saying it. But I do know one thing. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I do know one thing. I am passionate about him and his word and leading it, doing it. When they're finishing up today, you know, God calls believers to share the gospel with others. You know, believers are to be careful to point others to Jesus. You know, and believers are to intentionally go and engage with people who have not heard the gospel message. And believers must partner with others to more effectively share the gospel. That's what this church does. It should continue and always will. Thank you for the time that I've been here and I hope this lesson's blessed any someone and I pray that uh, well in my prayer let me pray and we'll close out our gracious heavenly father lord I thank you this day for this lesson and lord I just pray that the holy spirit aroused hearts and brother I pray that there was anyone here that doesn't know you or is watching that doesn't know you that uh, that, uh, that they would just find you today Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to lead your word and I thank you that the Holy Spirit guides and leads us and corrects us as, as he does. And as Father, I just pray that uh, be with us as we go back, go through this, this virus that's going around this world and this country. I pray for this nation. And Lord, I pray that our people will be back together in church very soon. Father, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, man.